Good afternoon. Welcome to um, the 2020 Hot Topics in Environmental Law Summer Lecture Series brought to you by the Environmental Law Center at Vermont Law School. I'm Jenny Rushlow, Director of the Environmental Law Center and Associate Dean for Environmental Programs here at BLF. I'm gonna bring up a list of resources on the screen to direct you to some of our programs here at the Ver Environmental Law Center, for those of you who are looking to learn more. And you can also view our full hot topics lineup by going to the website, vermontlaw.edu backslash hot dash topics. Each of these talks is worth one Vermont CLE credit. So if you're an attorney looking to collect those credits, please keep track of which talks you attend for your records. And there will be time um, at the end of today's presentation for Q&A. So please type your question in the chat box at any point during the lecture, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the remaining time. For today's talk, we are very pleased to welcome Professor David Wirth. David Wirth is Professor of Law at Boston College Law School, where he has served as Director of International Programs. He teaches environmental, administrative, public international and foreign relations law. Previously, he was senior attorney and co-director of international programs for the Natural Resources Defense Council and attorney advisor for oceans and international environmental and scientific affairs for the US Department of State. He is the author of more than five dozen books, articles and reports on international environmental law and policy for both legal and popular audiences. He's a graduate of Yale Law School, and he holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in chemistry from Princeton and Harvard, respectively. We are very lucky that this is Professor Worth's 29th year teaching in the Vermont Law School summer program, and this year he's teaching, of course, the international law of food. Today, his talk is entitled USMCA NAFTA 2.0 Implications for Sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Worth. Thank you, thank you, Jenny, for that very kind introduction and uh, uh, fantastic arithmetic on your part. My first year here uh, at Vermont Law School was the summer of 1992. Uh, I have had the immense good fortune to have spent 20 of those years teaching a course on international trade and the environment. Uh, this year, I'm teaching a new course on the international law of food, but this talk brings me back to uh, one of my first loves, namely the relationship between uh, trade and environment. And uh, I had hoped to be wearing a headset today so you couldn't see that I haven't had a haircut in 10 weeks, but uh, in, in any event, uh, soon you'll be looking at the PowerPoint and not me. Um, the, uh, let me see if I can, uh, the uh, before I start, I wanted to thank uh, I wanted to thank um, uh, a number of people who helped me put this talk together during the pandemic, um, namely Elizabeth Trujillo, Jackie Hand, and Sherry Chen. Um, and full disclosure, he, uh, Jenny has already described my background at uh, NRDC. I have also been a consultant to the North American Commission for Environmental Cooperation and um, an expert witness in the public citizen litigation against uh, the US Trade Representative and its challenges against NAF NAFTA and the Uruguay Round, a member of the Sierra Club International Committee and a member of the EPA Advisory Committee uh, to the North American Commission on Environmental Cooperation. Um, and I have the scars to show for all of them. I will be glad to uh, uh, to demonstrate them during the question and answer period, if uh, if you would like. Um, so USMCA or NAFTA 2.0 implications for sustainability. Uh, this is the what uh, what one group uh, somewhat facetiously called a redo of NAFTA, the trilateral agreement among the United States, uh, Mexico, and Canada that was originally done in 1993 uh, and adopted during the uh, first Clinton administration. The uh, principle 0.0, .0 uh, 
in this presentation is that the current administration uh, does not, or at least the current president, does not understand trade agreements and how they work, um, at least given the public statements that is the implication. Uh, you may have noticed a shift when the new administration came into, uh, when the new administration came into office, um, emphasizing uh, the balance of trade, trade deficits, trade surpluses, and giving the impression that trade agreements somehow regulate them. First of all, economists like Paul Krugman will tell you that, that trade balances don't really matter anyway, but that is exactly how these agreements do not work. So uh, welcome to this presentation and after the end of it, you will understand too, in fact, how trade agreements work. Uh, they do not regulate balance of payments. In fact, they are balances of trade. What they do is to deregulate them. Um, so I will uh, take this occasion uh, to, as they would say, where I grew up, to, um, to learn you a bit of trade law. Um, the, let me make sure that this is working mechanically. All right, seems to be fine. Um, imagine that we have two countries that, uh, that produce two goods, one agricultural products and the other manufactured goods. Um, the cost of the two products in the, in the two countries is different. Uh, in Fredonia, agricultural products, grain are expensive, uh, maybe because of soil, climate conditions, uh, the availability of labor. In Mauritania, uh, it's lower. And the reverse is true with respect to automobiles, with respect to manufactured goods. Economists call these factors of production. The, um, the insight of the 18th century British economist, David Ricardo, uh, not terribly difficult, to see from the, from the point of view of the 21st century was that um, if trade occurs between the two countries, then uh, the public consumers, you and I will be better off um, if you and I will be better off if we can purchase, say if we are Fredonian citizens, if we can continue to purchase cheap manufactured goods, uh, domestically, but have access to imported food. Um, and the opposite is true for uh, the public in Ruritania. Um, the way trade agreements work is to open up the border between the two states by reducing trade barriers. Um, and uh, the basic agreement in any free trade agreement, which is uh, includes NAFTA, uh, the World Trade Organization suite of agreements, and um, uh, every other free trade agreement. The basic handshake is we will reduce our trade barriers if you reduce yours. We will reduce our trade barriers if you reduce yours. Uh, and so free trade comes about not because of a regulation of the, uh, of the balance of trade, but in fact, because of the deregulation of it altogether, that is removal of trade barriers. Um, now, the, the basic political deal that makes a free trade agreement work is obvious from the slide, which is that it involves a coalition between um, export competitive industries, the automobile industry in Fredonia, the agricultural uh, sector in Ruritania. Both of them have low costs and um, are competitive in the export market and an alliance between the export competitive industries and sectors with the public, again, you and me. Uh, the losers in this arrangement are those sectors that are not competitive in the export market. That is the agricultural sector in Fredonia on the left and the uh, manufacturing sector in Ruritania on the right. Now, you may very well ask, what does all of this has, have to do with environment? And as I say in Russian, uh, now I will tell you. Uh, if the reason that, um, that prices for food and agricultural commodities in Fredonia are high is not just because of the factors of production, the climate and, uh, uh, and availability of labor, but because of governmental regulation in the form of food safety measures, for instance, 
um, then uh, we will see the those food safety measures and those regulations treated as trade barriers by the trade agreement. Similarly, in Ruritania, if the reason that automobiles are expensive in, in Ruritania by comparison with Fredonia is that Ruritania has high environmental standards and requires, as the United States does, onboard pollution controls in the form of catalytic converters, then part of this cost going on here on the right-hand side is indeed the environmental cost, the cost of maintaining a, a, a healthy environment. So that explains why um, trade barriers can include tariffs, quotas, subsidies, uh, local content restriction, uh, everybody hates them, but uh, the um, also domestic regulations in the form of environmental food or product safety, also governmentally established lending requirements. And one of the big uh, one of the big disputes in this area concerned uh, labeling for environmentally sourced tuna, which basically is the beginning of time for the trade and environment uh, uh, problem in 1991. So in a nutshell, the, uh, the basic deal is we'll reduce our trade barriers if you reduce yours. The obligations are to refrain from certain actions, that is uh, maintaining existing trade barriers or erecting new ones. Um, and they are negative in character in the sense that they constrain governmental behavior. The benefits are market access. Um, at the same time, there is um, an important component, one structural attribute of a trade agreement is that one side receives the benefits that is market access only if the other side performs. Uh, it's axiomatic in the public international law field that every international agreement involves a flow of rights and benefits. This free trade agreements are particularly tightly coupled in the sense that um, Fredonia on the left-hand side of the page uh, has takes on obligations in the form of pain, reducing its trade barriers, which presumably have some domestic constituency, uh, food safety measures, for instance, uh, reducing its trade barriers, while it gets the benefits only if the treaty partner performs. Not all treaties are structured this way, but these are particularly tightly uh, connected. Uh, the obligations that a state takes on are all painful, and the benefits are are totally dependent on the performance of the treaty partner. The um, one other aspect is that international dispute settlement uh, becomes increasingly important. And you can see why from the structure of the agreement. Fredonia gets the benefits only to the extent that Ruritania performs. Therefore, Fredonia has a huge interest in Ruritania's performance. And as a result, in all free trade agreements, modern free trade agreements, we have among the most uh, most powerful dispute settlement mechanisms that are known in public international law. So in a, in a, uh, in a nutshell, the basic trade and environment problem is, is this product standard ostensibly desi designed to protect public health, A, a disguised barrier to trade, presumably to protect domestic industry, or is it B, a legitimate exercise of state sovereignty and police power? The trade agreement is pushing in the direction of number one, uh, take it down, remove it, uh, create market access, and environmental policy of the sort that we study at Vermont Law School tends to be two. Uh, a presumption that this is a legitimate exercise of state sovereignty and the trade agreement uh, consequently operates to uh, threaten environmental regulation, at least in some situations. Um, historically, there are three basic disciplines. Um, one is the most favored nation discipline. You've probably heard of it. But legal content is requires a state importing goods from a variety of sources to refrain from discrimination among the sources of imported goods. So for those of you with a long memory, you may recall that every year the United States Congress for uh, would debate whether to grant most favored nation status to China. Uh, the MFN discipline is of ancient origin, historically was granted on a bilateral basis. As soon as China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, all WTO member states have 
um, MFN status visa to each other, no longer up for debate in the US Congress. So um, uh, the second major discipline is discipline being just a fancy term for an obligation, national treatment to refrain from discrimination, again, a negative obligation, don't discriminate between imported and domestically produced goods. The second major uh, point that one needs to understand in, uh, in looking at free trade agreements is the negotiation process, at least within the United States. Um, the uh, students of the US Constitution, which of course include all of us, um, know that the Article 2, Section 2 of the, uh, of the Constitution gives the president the exclusive power as the Constitution states to, um, as the Constitution states to make treaties. So the president and only the president has the capacity to negotiate with foreign powers on behalf of the United States. Uh, Article two, section two then specifies the president negotiates the agreement, brings it back, presents it to the Senate for its advice and consent to ratification. Um, one may read even in Supreme Court opinions that the Senate ratifies treaties. This is incorrect. The president and only the president ratifies treaty. The Senate gives its advice and consent, but this is an important function and uh, part of the checks and balances system when the president is involved in making law in the form of a treaty. A supermajority two thirds requirement in the Senate before the treaty can go forward. Now, if you think about a trade agreement, which consists of a series of negative obligations, we are going to, in the future, uh, agree to refrain from certain actions. Uh, they, this presents a very serious difficulty when it comes to the Senate. So for instance, imagine a, a new trade agreement, the USMCA, that uh, eliminates, as it does, by the way, with respect to Canada, that uh, uh, purports to eliminate dairy subsidies, um, which is a trade barrier subsidy. Um, this comes to the Senate and Let's assume that our, uh, our own uh, Senator Pat Leahy, um, who did not vote against the USMCA, uh, says, oh, this is a very nice agreement with the exception of the dairy subsidies. I'm going to strike that one out. The law is that the president can then ratify the agreement only with the changes that have been made in the Senate. So the trade agreement, which is a delicately balanced instrument in the case of USMCA, involving three states, in the case of um, the World Trade Organization involving 140 states, member states, more than 140 member states, um, is exquisitely susceptible to the death by a thousand cuts uh, phenomenon within the Senate. So to prevent that, since 1974, there's been a process in place uh, since in the Trade Act of 1974 that, um, creates a different mechanism. The so domestic legal authority for a treaty in the Article II sense is the Senate advice and consent to ratification. Um, this substitutes a different uh, legal basis, which is first of all, a prior statutory authorization coming from the Congress uh, uh, by simple majority vote in both houses of the Congress. This is, used to be called fast track, now it's called trade promotion authority because among other things, Fast Track got a rather bad name. Um, the president goes out and negotiates the agreement with foreign powers, brings it home, and then submits it to both houses of the Congress for adoption of implementing legislation on an up or down vote, a yes or no vote. And by the way, being a former State Department employee, I should, uh, I, it's part of my job description to tell you that the Congress does not have the constitutional authority to approve the agreement. All it can do is to adopt the implementing legislation uh, and give the agreement domestic effect. In the end, what we have are two statutory pillars supporting the agreement. The first is the prior statutory authorization, and the second is the adoption of the implementing legislation. And the defining feature is the yes or no vote. So. Senator Leahy or and other members of Congress uh, cannot go through and uh, pick the agreement to death. Uh, rather, they can only vote yes or no. Uh, and this has been thought to be necessary 
in order to secure the integrity of trade agreements. Uh, every, tra every trade agreement since the Tokyo Round in GATT in 1979 has received uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of legal underpinning, that is two statutory authorizations before, before the fact, before the negotiations, and then afterwards for the implementing legislation. And uh, most every constitutional scholar, uh, with the uh, prominent exception of, of one at uh, Harvard Law School who has some qualms about this, uh, but every other constitutional scholar believes that this is fully the equivalent of uh, the Senate advice and consent function. That is two statutory, not one, but two statutory authorizations playing the role of the Senate advice and consent function. Okay, so that's the background. NAFTA. Um, it was, and this is to some extent ancient history, but uh, for those of us who have been around <laughs> for long enough, uh, it still seems fresh. It was negotiated by the uh, George H.W. Bush administration, Bush 41, um, during the 1992 campaign. Then candidate uh, Bill Clinton uh, stated that he did not intend to uh, renegotiate the, uh, the basic agreement. This is at a speech at North Carolina State University that got almost no attention uh, and is generally thought to be uh, a reassurance to the business community that there would be some uh, uh, continuity between the two administrations with respect to the trade agreements. It was negotiated roughly contemporaneously with the Uruguay Round and GATT, which is potentially uh, universal, which created the World Trade Organization. There's a, there are many parallels between them. And it's a preferential or regional trade agreement that meshes with WTO rules. If you think about it, giving preference to Mexico and Canada can run afoul of the MFN discipline. I'll be glad to answer questions on that. Uh, I've in fact taught an entire course on it uh, and the topic is rather complicated, but uh, not to worry, the, the two, the potentially global WTO and the regional trade agreements uh, uh, mesh because of rules addressing the relationship between the two of them. Now, NAFTA. Um, the uh, concerns about NAFTA from an environmental point of view uh, include uh, chapter seven, sanitary and phytosanitary measures. Um, as I said to my class recently, phytosanitary to a, uh, an international audience, phytosanitary is not the sort of word one hears walking around on the street every day, uh, even among native speakers. Um, sanitary and phytosanitary measures relate to quarantines and scoop up for our purposes, food safety measures. Um, there's a parallel chapter in the WTO. It's been very controversial in, uh, first of all, in addressing uh, a ban within the EU on seven, on six hormones in beef. Um, and second of all, the EU effective ban on imports of genetically modified foods and crops, GMOs, uh, both of which the EU lost. There's a parallel chapter in NAFTA. So grave concern about these disciplines. And remember, they are negative. They are don'ts um, so that they do not address, they do not require any state to have food safety measures at all. In fact, one way to, for a state to comply is to have no food safety measures uh, on its books. On the other hand, if a state chooses to maintain them, then they can be attacked through as trade barriers. That was the reason for the little tutorial at the beginning. Second of all, uh, standards related measures. These include labeling, uh, they include uh, product safety measures, for instance, with respect to toys. And again, in a negative sense, in the thou shalt not maintain the measure. Um, and there have been challenges both in the WTO and in NAFTA to, for instance, labeling for uh, sustainably sourced tuna. Um, chapter 11 deals with investment. Um, our own John Ashwarya has uh, been, has made a name for himself quite appropriately in this field. This is the equivalent of the Fifth Amendment's takings clause on the international level, the, an analog, not the equivalent really, uh, an analog. Um, and uh, 
has been the subject of quite grave concern. Um, the very first challenge, uh, one feature of the, NAFTA was the first trade agreement to include an investment chapter. And uh, the source of law, the history of this area of the law is entirely different than uh, the law of trading goods. Uh, and it includes investor state dispute settlement. Disputes in under chapter seven, under chapter nine, would require the United States government to take, or if our, one of the other two NAFTA governments to, to take up the cause and challenge on a government to government basis, the actions uh, of the other NAFTA party. Here, these investment challenges can be initiated by private parties, which makes them very powerful. Second of all, they're adjudicated by um, uh, investment uh, tribunals consisting of independent experts appointed in their personal capacity. When I did a Fulbright in, in Moscow, uh, all of my students were interested in this field because it's very lucrative. Uh, I was asked to speak at a, at a conference uh, and the speakers who came in from a variety of countries, including Russia, were all uh, extremely well-dressed. The men all had uh, jackets with real buttonholes that actually worked and uh, tailored suits. Me, I had my American off the, uh, off the rack suit and my mail order button down uh, Oxford shirt. And I felt as if I should uh, crawl under the table in the company of uh, these people who were basically dressed like movie stars. Uh, and appropriate, I, one can understand because there are, uh, uh, it is a tremendously lucrative field. It's all done privately. One of the presentations, by the way, was about the concentration of uh, these opportunities as arbitrators in a very small number of people. And then last, intellectual property. Just quickly, this deals with patents, trademarks, copyrights, and the theory is that the absence of that kind of protection can be a trade bearer. Now, if you look at these four bullets, what do they have in common? One would not expect to see intellectual property, investment, and food safety measures negotiated in the same agreement. Um, what they all have in common is that they are barriers to trade or investment. And so we have what I call the salad bowl effect that, that entirely disparate sorts of measures get mixed together uh, and presented to the Congress for its up or down vote in the implementing legislation. Quickly, uh, NEPA, um, there was a NEPA challenge by a public citizen based on uh, the uh, district Court in the District of Columbia held that a full EIS was necessary. That was reversed by the DC Circuit. Um, and the law basically now is that there can be no environmental challenges directly to trade agreements. Um, if you recall, candidate Clinton said he would not renegotiate the basic disciplines, that is the trade disciplines and the solution to the environment problem that was raised by any number of groups was to have a side agreement which uh, establishes the North American Commission on Environmental Cooperation, which includes a citizen submission process. The theory was that, that the environment problem in North America was not the absence of standards or legislation, including Mexico, but the absence of enforcement. So that citizens, you and I, the groups that represent us can make a, uh, a submission to the Commission for Environmental Cooperation located in Montreal, which will then uh, investigate the lack of enforcement or alleged lack of enforcement and publish a factual record. Now, those of us who are administra administrative lawyers, which includes all of us, of course, know that the lack of enforcement is extraordinarily difficult to prove. And number one and number two is enforcement is the area of greatest discretion in our system. Uh, so as a result, there have only been two factual records against the United States. One dealt with migratory birds. When I was on the EPA advisory committee, I uh, went to a meeting and asked the representative from the Department of Justice, well, what are you gonna do with this report? And she looked at me blankly and said, do? What are we going to do with it? We're not going to do anything with it. <laughs> and then uh, the second is mercury from coal-fired power plants. Um, very tellingly, the present administration announced its intention to relax its current um, Clean Air Act standards on mercury from coal-fired power plants mere hours after the adoption of the USMCA in 2018. So uh, the, the 
the citizen submission process has been important in highlighting issues that hasn't been terribly effective in changing the behavior of the US government. NAFTA was supported by most major environmental organizations except the Sierra Club as the greenest trade agreement uh, ever. It was opposed by a public citizen, so there was a schism in the environmental community. And as I always say to my class, uh, and I was there to witness this, you've never seen the fur fly as when environmentalists go after each other. Okay, USMCA. Uh, now we're getting to the uh, crux of the talk. Uh, you may remember that candidate Trump blamed trade agreements in general and NAFTA in particular for offshoring US jobs, US trade deficits and uh, similar ills. Uh, upon taking office, he terminated US participation in the 12 party Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which was a uh, multilateral regional plur um, preferential trade agreement, Pacific Rim, uh, that uh, arguably would have been in the, in the United States larger interest. Uh, Trump pulled out and uh, the agreement went forward uh, nonetheless. This is the one that was opposed by candidate Sanders uh, in before the 2016 election was opposed by candidate Trump uh, and John Podesta famously, uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign manager said, no, 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 she really is opposed to it, notwithstanding to the fact that uh, it had been negotiated by the Obama administration. So uh, the uh, Trump administration also pulled out of the transatlantic partnership, which would have been effectively a United States EU trade agreement, the EU as a customs union, a regional economic integration organization negotiates as a group. I got myself in big trouble at the uh, British consulate in Boston when I referred to it as, quote, the EU bilateral. <laughs> I got glowers from the consul herself. Uh, but I was only repeating what the US trade representative, which negotiates these agreements, how the US trade representative uh, described it and effectively it would have been a bilateral. There has been a recently, subsequent to that, there's been a an agreement between Canada and the EU that is roughly the analog, the analog of what would have been the transatlantic partnership. So the Trump White House says that um, um, NAFTA is perhaps the worst trade deal ever made. Um, and the uh, administration proposed to renegotiate it. It concluded the agreement in November, um, on November 30th, 2018, after Trudeau was reported to have sacrificed US access, US access to the Canadian dairy market. Then, and this has been relatively little reported because it actually occurred during the uh, during the unfolding of the uh, of the impeachment inquiry. Um, the agreement uh, would have been presented to the uh, democratically controlled House, which was uh, taking uh, which was taking office in the 116th Congress convening in January 2019. Uh, Nancy Pelosi managed to basically send it back for renegotiation. And in December of 2019, the trilateral protocol of amendment was adopted. This is an extraordinarily important instrument because it makes, as we'll see, uh, significant changes to USMCA. It got very little um, uh, attention in the press. And if you look at the date, the reason is obvious because it was going on in the middle of the impeachment inquiry. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the uh, agreement passed both chambers of the Congress in December, 2019, January, uh, 2020. Um, only 10 senators voted against it, including um, um, our own Senator Markey and Senator Vermont Senator Sanders, but most even Democrats were in favor of it and mere days ago it entered into force. So what does it mean? Um, here I'm talking about the agreement proper. Uh, that is the disciplines, including the, the, the disciplines on trading goods and the disciplines on uh, on investment, chapter 11. Major change, elimination of investor state dispute settlement with respect to Canada. Um, this had been 
the subject of very great concern. Uh, there was uh, the very first challenge. It was thought that the problem in 1993 was Mexico. The very first challenge was by a U.S. investor against Canada, strangely, about a uh, fuel additive uh, called methylcyclopentadienyl manganese tricarbonyl. That's my chemistry background, or MMT. And it went downhill from there. There was a successful challenge against a uh, uh, by a U.S. investor uh, when Mexico pushed back against the establishment of a hazardous waste dump in its country. And uh, as recently as 2015, there was a successful challenge uh, to a quarry with an award of by the the remedies here are, are in money damages, uh, an award of seven million dollars against Canada. So the elimination of investor state dispute settlement, this is probably the biggest change in USMCA proper. Further additions to list of the environmental agreements exempted from the operation of the trade disciplines. Uh, since 1991 in the famous tuna dolphin dispute, uh, there have been concerns about uh, major multilateral agreements dealing with protection of the ozone layer, trade in hazardous waste and trade in endangered species, CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, uh, their susceptibility to challenge under the trade agreements. NAFTA exempted some, the list was lengthened, but no mention of climate. Improvement in rights, um, this is not my specialty, but uh, there is a reference to a non-binding declaration from the International Labor Organization, but no references to the major human rights conventions dealing with the right to organize and bargain collectively which the United States has never accepted. Um, again, this is not my area of expertise, but major change in the protocol of amendment uh, that dropped the portion on biologics, which pharma objected to as, um, as political. Some observers, including in particular public citizen, claimed it was a giveaway to the pharmaceutical industry under the IP protections, which have been substantially expanded, the patent term was expanded in the GATT or where I ran and the World Trade Organization in a trade agreement of all places. And then last chapter 28 on regulatory cooperation, some concern about dilution of regulatory standards uh, through cooperation. This was an issue in uh, NAFTA proper. There were harmonization working groups, which were not open to the public. Um, and my prediction is we're going to see more action here. Uh, many thanks to Elizabeth Trujillo for her slides on a separate chapter on environment, chapter 24. The tendency in recent years since NAFTA has been to include environment in its own, in its own box. Uh, remember that uh, President Clinton said he would not renegotiate the basic disciplines. Instead, labor and environment were uh, set, set off in separate agreements uh, on uh, environment and labor, uh, respectively. Various agreements since then, the uh, DR-CAFTA, Dominican Republic, Central America Free Trade Agreement, uh, the Canada Free Trade Agreement with the EU, CETA, um, the TPP, um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, the Transatlantic Partnership all have, uh, now have environmental provisions. Um, as noted on this slide, it's somewhat ironic that uh, the environment chapter of, of USMCA is largely taken from uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Trump repudiated. But um, if that were the biggest irony in this, in this field, then um, um, uh, I think we would all be happy. The scope of the environmental protection is expanded as compared to with some changes to the citizen submission pro uh, process, uh, references to corporate, corporate social responsibility, and um, the need for environmental goods and services. The, the problem with the environment chapter is that it is, from my point of view, and this is my personal view, I should box it off, is that it is not uh, connected to the basic disciplines. In other words, um, it could be more or less plausibly understood as a freestanding agreement to cooperate on the environment, as opposed to how does this affect the negative disciplines that are 
that look like vehicles for uh, relaxing standards on matters such as food safety or product labeling. Um, so as a um, conclusion, uh, Trump said that USMCA is incredible. The trade representative, which negotiated with someone, which negotiated it with somewhat more restraint, it modernizes NAFTA. Public citizen, Ralph Nader says that it's not a truly progressive agreement, but they were thrilled with the removal of the um, investor state dispute settlement. Uh, the environmental community as a whole said, well, it's a huge missed opportunity to act on climate. Uh, of course, the United States had withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement by that point, no surprise. So uh, just as a final thought, is it incredible as Trump said, um, there is a tendency in these agreements, particularly under this administration, to ramp up how, how destructive they are, particularly with respect to the balance of trade, and then to claim victory early with relatively modest results. Um, probably NAFTA is not as bad as the president suggested, nor is USMCA uh, such a dramatic change. The structure of it, contrary to the political rhetoric, is is basically more of the same, although one can consider it to be some progress. Modern, that's what USTR said. Maybe, fair enough. Uh, is it evolution, not revolution, as the Denton's law firm in Canada said in a, in a message to its clients? I think that's fair. It's a, it's a tweak to NAFTA. Uh, not a truly progressive trade agreement, as Public Citizen and uh, Ralph Nader said. Well, it depends on your view of what a purposes of a trade, a progressive trade agreement would be. From my point of view, um, a progressive agreement, a trade agreement would re require the internalization of environmental costs. So that when I purchase an imported product, uh, the price reflects the, uh, the way it was produced and in particular, whether it was produced with renewable energy uh, climate preserving energy on the one hand or climate degrading fossil fuel. And that, uh, if we could intervene in that trade and assure sustainability in trade the, uh, in, in all goods, then we would truly be meshing the environmental goals and the negative disciplines. This is not going to happen for probably at least another generation. Um, and the trade policy people would say, well, uh, the, the real question here is whether deregulated trade, which is what we've been talking about, is sustainable trade. My guess is that most, most of the audience here would say that the answer to that question is no, deregulation does not equal sustainability. Uh, but how does one mesh the two? Uh, trade policy types would say, well, if you want to uh, require that all coffee be fair traded, what does fair trade mean? Costa Rica has a different view of what fair trade is than Kenya does. Uh, or more accurately, Costa Rican manufacturers or producers have a different view of what fair trade is than Kenyan producers. Um, they would say that this is probably choosing winners and losers in trade and uh, international trade and structuring trade relations as opposed to deregulating. And then last, is it a missed opportunity on climate? Most definitely. Uh, I just described how the agreement could have required the internalization of environmental costs. Um, uh, welfare economists, uh, environmental economists all encourage that as the remedy for pollution. Pollution comes about because of uh, market failures with respect to uh, uh, the lack of pricing for public goods. Uh, it is a missed opportunity on, on climate. All you have to do is read the agreement. So thank you very much. And um, I welcome your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Ward. That was a really interesting talk. We have a few minutes to ask some questions um, from our audience. And as a reminder for our listeners, for those of you who are watching on your website live stream, you can click on the watch on live stream icon at the bottom of the video, which will bring up the chat box where you can add your question. Or if you're watching on your Facebook live stream, you can add your question to the comment box below and we will try to get through as many questions as we can. First question for you, Professor Ward. Um, 
particularly given your experience in the State Department and perhaps your familiarity with him and his long career in politics, what are your thoughts on um, what a Biden presidency might look like when it comes to um, when it comes to this trade instrument and um, negotiating trade instruments with an eye on sustainability? Uh, well, I have to say, I haven't followed uh, candidate Biden's statements with respect to trade agreements. Um, I don't know that he's made any that are particularly uh, that are particularly precise. But one thing that um, I think we can say is that the public in the United States is now, even if they don't understand the basic the basics of the primer that was presented here, they uh, they have been. Uh, they have been acculturated to at least have some skepticism about trade agreements, uh, largely because of the candidacy of Bernie Sanders in the previous election, as well as this one. Um, uh, Senator Sanders is famously a, a big skeptic of, of trade agreements in general, uh, for largely the reasons that I just, that I just set out here. Uh, most trade agreements and most trade policy has been uh, contrary to popular belief, established during democratic presidencies. So the uh, the WTO and the old GATT are basically the equivalent of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, it's a little bit difficult to be opposed to the Dormant Commerce Clause and have been thought to be, uh, have been progressive in their time. So what I think what's happening is that uh, the Sanders candidacy and shifts in public opinion in the country are are pushing more towards the kind of analysis that um, I just gave. And you can see that in the amendment to USMCA, the agreement between when it was adopted at the end of 2018 and when it was presented to the Congress and uh, in the beginning of 2020. That's all because it was basically sent back for renegotiation to address some of these more, these uh, issues of concern. So I think that um, that one could expect from a Biden presidency, given that he is a uh, political animal, somewhat uh, more shift in the direction of the, uh, the the sorts of changes that I was describing, although I personally have not heard him make any pronouncements on these agreements. The, uh, for instance, remember that Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State when the, uh, the TPP was negotiated. She was basically backed into a corner by uh, by Sanders on the one hand and Trump on the other. Uh, uh, the concerns about trade agreements are numerous, including offshoring of jobs. You can see how it happens given the structure of the agreements. Um, so I, I think that the short answer to the question is I think the public has shifted and one can expect a Biden presidency to reflect that to some extent. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is border carbon adjustment or any, any type of environmental border adjustment ever mentioned or deliberated during the negotiation? Um, not that I know of. The, uh, these are sometimes called environmental countervailing duties. Countervailing duties are a response to dumping from foreign states that or foreign countries that may allow uh, the introduction of uh, the uh, export of their goods at below market prices. And the idea of a countervailing duty is to offset that, that unfair benefit. Uh, this is what the current president has been talking about when he says that uh, China is not playing by the rules. Uh, and in fact, countervailing duties have been a big issue in the WTO. Um, environmental countervailing duties are an idea that have been kicking around for some time, but so far as I can see, it's thought to be, uh, it hasn't gotten an awful lot of traction. For the reasons that I said, it's difficult to calculate them. But look, we've dealt with investment, we've dealt with intellectual property, neither of these was a big issue in trade agreements before. Um, it's not that, that the collective wisdom of professionals working in these fields is, is not sufficient to address them. It is a lack of political will and also the concern about choosing uh, winners and losers. One thing to keep your eye on is, and this has been lurking in the, in the policy background for several years, 
is the possibility of a carbon tax. Uh, the present administration has the, uh, is somewhat distracted from this, but there is a, a groundswell of um, opinion even among uh, mainstream Republicans such as George Shultz and former Secretary of the Treasury James Baker in favor of a carbon tax as a solution, a partial solution to uh, the climate problem in the United States. If every bill that has ever been introduced on uh, with climate, uh, with a, uh, a carbon tax has included at the border offsets of this sort. And it, they are not politically viable without them. So if the United States gets to the point of, keep your eye on this, gets to the point of, of debating a carbon tax domestically, there will almost certainly be some discussion of these kinds of at the border offsets. And that would be what I would think would be the first entry point for these kinds of uh, uh, countervailing duties discussions. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. It is, can you speak to agriculture in the new agreement and the ability for countries to regulate for health and nutrition? Well, the, um, uh, I mean, their agriculture is a very complicated business, including subsidies and, uh, and food safety measures and a, and a variety of components. It's difficult to uh, address them all at once. But I, I, have a, uh, I have a feeling that what's on the questioner's mind is, uh, maybe this is one of my students in my international law of food course, in which case, uh, uh, good going. Uh, whether the USMCA is designed to articulate a holistic view of agriculture, including sustainable sourcing, uh, a variety of issues such as the absence of antibiotics, uh, uh, farm to table uh, movements and uh, other uh, areas of social concern. And the answer, so far as I can see in the agreement is no, that there is not a, uh, a broad concept of uh, agriculture as a sector that's terribly different from what we saw in the previous NAFTA, which is tolerance of, of very large agricultural subsidies in the United States and um, which can, are obviously trade distorting. And second of all, uh, still the emphasis uh, on the negative disciplines of, of uh, concerns about food safety. One of the big issues to, entirely apart from USMCA, and we will address this in my class, is to keep, uh, to keep in mind is the relationship between the Food Safety Modernization Act of 2010 and, uh, and these trade disciplines. FISMA, uh, the Food Safety and Modernization Act, expressly addresses imports. And I think you can see how uh, these new measures could potentially run afoul of some of the disciplines. In fact, a lot of exporting countries objected to FISMA in the uh, World Trade Organization when it was uh, under consideration in the United States. So uh, in terms of a second issue to keep your eye on in the future, uh, what about attempts by the United States uh, and other countries to, uh, to juice up, to beef up their capacities in the food safety area? And not just food safety, but also sustainability, uh, sustainably harvested products, uh, products that are manufactured consistent with international labor standards. Uh, the whole issue of how products are produced is one that has gotten insufficient attention in trade agreements and in fact has largely been uh, beaten back by trade agreements such as NAFTA and, uh, and the WTO suite of agreements. That doesn't seem to change in USMCA, despite the fact that the public is moving in the direction of greater concern for these, what are called process and production methods. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Worth for that talk and thank you to our listeners for those great questions. Our next hot topic will take place on July 14th, and we hope that you can join us then. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.